Hello everyone, welcome back to a new series which I am coining. I love telly so I'm gonna find out if I can consume my favourite media in video game form. I don't know, I'm working on it. But you know what show I love? You know what show I love? I love Desperate Housewives. Based on a close-knit group of housewives who reside on a street, Wisteria Lane, in a fictional town named Fairview. On the surface, it may seem like the perfect neighbourhood, but it hides many a secret. Crimes, forbidden romances, and domestic struggles. But it also has a goofy, silly, and cringeworthy side. Moments that I love the most. So let me introduce you to Desperate Housewives of the Game. Here's your spoiler alert. So without any further ado, on with the game. Desperate Housewives The Game is a life simulation game based on the TV series. Developed by Liquid Entertainment and published by Buena Vista Games, it released in late 2006. The style of this game is very, and I mean very, similar to our Sims. Our story takes place over 12 episodes uncovering the secrets of our character, narrated by our Mary Alice, and contains voice acting galore. So we're greeted as one is always greeted into an episode of Desperate Housewives. Mary Alice talking absolute bollocks. It is natural for one to develop a facade to influence how people perceive us. Some project an image of perfection to mask their basic insecurities. Others don't have the luxury of worrying about first impressions. And some people find their best in often backfire. Yes, we all veil our truths, but how we leave an impression is what defines us. So, time to create our family. But it turns out we can only have a husband and a son. We can't even change the clothes or anything. They are giving early 2000s bloke. My husband, who I aptly name Husband Pooh, he will be Peroxide Kyle McClanahan. And I changed my son, aptly named Boy Poo, into a bloke who now looks significantly older than his father. However, my creator sim fantasy can be fulfilled as we can change our poo. Look, she is serving. Sexy, demure, and my favorite pose, which is the moody bitch, casual. As it so happens, the name Pooh is a very common surname in Wisteria Lane, as there's already a family called Pooh, so I guess our family will become the Poodences instead. Ah yes. So my adventure as a desperate begins. I wonder where this journey into suburbia will take the Poodences. Unlike The Sims, we have loading screens in between episodes which contain CGI images of the girls, patrons of Wisteria Lane, and it, oh, cheeky bits of trivia. Oh yes, time to put my knowledge to the test. Call me John Pointless from Pointless. We are shown a cutscene in all its glory. My name is Mary Alice Young. When I recall my time on Wisteria Lane, I think mostly of good things. Well-maintained lawns and even better maintained housewives. Of course, there is another side to life on this idyllic street. A darker side. One that my friends and neighbors would do anything to cover up. While we all wish to be the person our neighbors envision us to be, there are always secrets we don't want our neighbors to know. Some are secrets in name only, out in the open for all the world to see while others find that no matter how much they try to conceal the truth, somehow things always find a way to come back to the surface. As the most successful real estate broker in town, Edie Britt has always understood the importance of first impressions. A bad first impression can cause a prospective buyer to question their decision. While a strong impression will allow you to beat prospective buyers to the punch. However, first impressions can often be misleading. When Edie first met her new neighbors, she thought she had met the perfect family. But as Edie and everyone else in the neighborhood will soon find out, 
There's no such thing as the perfect family. Pooh is putting on some slap, trying to conceal some nasty scar. I never chose it, but hey, makes it look kind of cool. Or is it a metaphor? What secrets is our Pooh trying to conceal within that Nyx can't stop, won't stop concealer wand? What has our Pooh experienced? Why is the son a bloke? So here comes our Edie knocking on my door, but I'm distracted by this little cursor, which is slaying and or serving. I tell her to call me Pooh. Ah yes, calling my character Pooh will never get old. Um, sorry not sorry. Hashtag sorry funny. I choose all the nice responses because you know what? I bloody love that ED. Then Brie turns up unannounced and it's uncanny how much she looks like Brie. I'm bloody made up though. This is so bloody cool. I was just having coffee with some of the other women of Wisteria Lane and I was wondering if you'd like to join us. But I mean, if you all want to meet me so bad, why don't you just come over here? I've got things to do. But reluctantly, I go over to hers with a very poo response. My husband and my son moved into town not too long ago. I came over because I wanted to meet my new neighbours. Oh, how nice. And how long have you and your husband been together? Um, excuse me, Susan. What's it to you? Alas, our poo, her wedding day is a bit hazy. And yes, Lynette, I agree. Apparently, Pooh had an accident and now has amnesia. Hmm, all a bit strange if you ask me. Brie rudely wants to change the subject from talking about me, but I'm the main character. So after telling Gabby and Susan to shut up, Brie states in an almost suffragette tone, Ladies, what do you say we cut the small talk and get down to business, hmm? Only just to start slagging Edie off. After telling Gabby that I couldn't think any less of her, I remember the pills that I found in my mailbox earlier. But I keep my lips zipped and tell Gabby to piss off. You know what, ladies? I think I can find a better way to waste my time than mindlessly gossiping about the neighbourhood tramp. So I'll be on my way too. Um, I guess that means I'm going home. <laughs> I tend to my garden, just call me Monty Don, and then try my hand at making jalapeno dinner. Just call me Jalepino Jane. I'm kind of having fun. Then the evil husband sneaks up on me. Oh, I got such a fright. It just makes me want to tell him all about my day. And then he says to me, Can it wait? My day felt extra long today. And I just want to rest and relax for a minute. Oh, woe is husband. He goes on and on about how hard it's been for him. I give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, oh, you should hear about my day. And then ignores me. Is dinner almost ready? Well, you know what, mate? There are plenty of frozen meals if you want to make your own dinner, you absolute twat. Look, here we are, the Pudences, my horrible, horrible family. I ask Pooh about his day, shortly discover that he fancies the teaching assistant. That is unacceptable behaviour in my household. Get out of my dining room. Finally, husband asked me about my day after patronising me and calling me a savvy lady. He swiftly apologises, only to be met with a smug who, followed by me scrutinising my husband about his new assistant. She must have some well-rounded skills. Once dinner's gone, of course, it's time for dessert. I offer some to the hubby. Ah, you fool. Not that kind of dessert. Wink. We end by seducing my husband. Sometimes, the stars align and two people hit it off immediately. Other times, only time will tell whom will prove to be a friend. And who will reveal themselves to be a worthy adversary. What is with that hag at the end? The most successful families are the ones that work together to achieve their goals. Of course, even the best-run households have the occasional kink or two to work out. But the truth is that no matter how well things seem to come together in a family, appearances can be deceiving. And when it comes to friends and neighbors, Appearances often have precious little to do with the reality of what's going on behind closed doors. 
many question has arose with that short film call it a24 or something i've never said a24 out loud you know when it's referring to the 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 company and not the road do you think they know that there's a road called a24 why did those peculiar blokes receive a box and why is that old hag watching everything that's going on all will shortly be revealed as the weird blokes arrive at my house knocking at the door just call them the post code lottery because they are knocking at my door in it there of course it's the daniel and frank the famous twins you know what they weren't even in the show daniel flox eh famous fashion designer eh never heard of you mate and then i ask our frank if he just mooches off his brother ah uh, it's all in jest though i'm just a big kidder frank is gonna set up my computer for free as a northerner if it's free i'll bloody take it whilst frank is working his magic tinkering away our Daniel starts bitching to me, and we're slagging off Susan. Oh, dreams do come true. Browser for you with a tutorial and a bookmarked homepage. When you start the browser for the first time. But Frank should really shut up because he's so bloody boring. And well, if anything goes wrong with my computer, I know who to blame. Once they have vacated my property, I go and have a cheeky play on the new computer. And look at this. Wacky news. Such wacky antics. There are even ads down the side, just like in real life. So wacky. However, now I must tend to my garden, the green-fingered being that I am. Just call me Island Hitchmarsh. I head over to Susan's for some reason, and whilst on my way, I bump into Deal Lynette. Turns out her boys stole Susan's art. Good on them. One thing leads to another. And now my heart's pounding, hands trembling, as I'm sneaking into Susan's house to return a masterpiece. A apparent masterpiece. Um... I didn't agree to this, did I? But I know it's a bit of a blur, to be honest. So I complete my quest for beloved Lynette, and she rewards me with a lovely one-for-all gift card that I will have difficulty using at thousands of retail stores around the United Kingdom. Suddenly, my phone rings, hey. and I'm still on edge. It gave me such a dreadful fright. I'm still trembling from the activity I've just partaken in. But it's my hobby. What could he possibly want? Oh, he wants me to go to a therapist. Oh, how's your day, darling? Fuck you. He also mentioned something about Paul Young. So I head over to the Young household, but then the game got jammed. But I know exactly what caused this error in the software. It's the fact that Paul Young looks so much like Paul Young. The old computer couldn't cope with it. But thank the Lord, this game has an autosave feature. God bless this mess. Oh, everyone, look at our little trivia. What house is Mike Delfino renting? The Sims. Um, holy shit guys, The Sims was mentioned in a Prudent Softy video. After all that excitement has ended, I head to my car, the Chrysler Pacifica. It just sounds so American, as opposed to what? A oh, good old Mini Cooper. Or, oh, loads of people have the Jaguar F-Pace, don't they? Oh well, at least they have accidents in them, eh? Watch out everyone, toot toot, peep beep. How do all these people afford these, these Jaguars as well? Cause he lives, innit? Cause he lives. But that is another story for another time. One commutes to the mall. Shopping centre. Cluster of shops as it were. Definitely not a mall. Onto the therapists I go. The, yeah, the retail therapists. Ah yes, I feel much better. So I guess I will go to the therapist. So I head to the building which I assume is the doctor's and it she's trying to load she's spluttering and i guess at the end of this room here's the therapist that the hubby wants me to see look at him the state of him looking at me it's dr fraser crane in it i'm listening hi doctor i am poo pudence so after bad mouthing my husband calling him a control freak and such i now find myself being quizzed by the bloke about my relationship with my husband how did we meet i can't remember my mind's like swish cheese, you know, from the accident. Doctor wants to help me recover my past, but I'm a bit on the fence about it all, you know. I'm not sure if I want to. The doctor is on my husband's side, though. He starts defending him and stuff. What the hell? I thought you were supposed to be impartial. I thought you were my mate. And I find myself blabbing about how I'm a jack of all trades. I bloody love saying that, though. Got my fingers in a lot of different pies, eh? I'm abruptly told the doctor has another appointment. I'm shoved out the door, kicked to the curb. I thought we had a moment. A spark, as it were. I'm left pondering. I've been given a lot of food for thought. 
However, one swiftly brought back to reality my husband and some floozy. His shirt was a bit ruffled and I was helping him out. That's it. Oh, I've heard that one before. All this trick in the book. Jackie, as it were, smugly states, oh, he never mentioned a wife. And you know what happens then? Those red flags start doing the thing that red flags do. Evil husband. Do yourself a favour and keep your hands and eyes to yourself, Jacqueline, with a big fat smile on my face and deliver whatever my husband wanted. Once back in my domestic prison, I do my womanly duties. A spot of washing, watch a bit of telly, probably that loose woman programme or something. On the news, they're talking about like naughty kids. Conveniently, I cheekily overhear my son, Boy Poo, saying some worrying things. What is precious Boy Poo talking about? I ask the most woman of all, Arbury, for some advice. However, turns out it was a big mistake as she'd been a right bitch very judgmental. Please don't take this the wrong way, but since neither of my children would ever be capable of anything even remotely illegal, I really don't have any advice to offer. Well, Briathy, whatever your surname is, I beg to differ. I've watched the telly show and I know what goes on behind closed doors. One thing leads to another. Now I'm asking Gabby for advice. She doesn't even have a child. But she breaks the news that Boy Poo has a girlfriend. The crazed mother that I am, I rush over there with haste and bang on that door to demand to know what's going on. And she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Said so it was some fox guy. Well, 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 call me the postcode lottery because I be the someone who's knocking at the door. Bang, 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 Daniel. Where is your brother? And of course, the bastard's out of town. I tell Daniel that to be frank, Frank sounds like a right weird bloke. And I kind of offended him. Ooh, cheeky poo. I must investigate this video game further though. However, I forgot the name of the game and just search war on the computer and hope for the best. And look, here it is. The shite game that Frank made or something. And there's a forum. I'm taken aback with the amount of cringe that I'm experiencing. My son's called That Damn Pudence Kid. Um, I need to have a few words. Parenting mode activated. Um, son, we need to talk. Mate, listen, you've got to stop sleeping with your shoes on. And your username is really fucking cringe. Especially when it comes to friends and family, truth can often be a dangerous thing. It sometimes seems concealing the truth from those closest to us is often the best course of action. On the other hand, when we discover what lies beneath, we may find the harsh reality forces us to grow even closer, even if it temporarily pushes us further apart. Sometimes we find out the hard way that knowledge can be a dangerous thing. And as Eve discovered in that infamous garden, too much of it can get you in a whole lot of trouble. We often fool ourselves into believing that true perfection is an attainable goal. But when others enter the equation, this can seem impossible. While focusing on the trivial aspects of life, we often fail to notice what is right under our noses. We may also learn that no matter how unpleasant things appear to be, there is always room for them to get more unpleasant. Pooby snooping in what I'm assuming is my son's knicker drawer. No, she's not happy. She, she's not happy with what she has happened upon within this evil drawer of sins and lies. So our goal here is to visit Susan and quiz her on Alison, this slag that my son is dating. My husband do be husbanding, however, Upon exiting my house, that old hag from earlier is in my front garden. Oh, here comes the flower queen. And then I say to her, Gee, I hope your seedlings don't shrivel up like your face did. Who is so hostile? Who hurt her? Anyway, here is Susan and Julie, a force to be reckoned with. I tell them about the pink panties, a thong no less, that I found in the boys' drawer. I go ask Julie, where are you, Julia bitch? I go ask Julie about Alison. Apparently one of these too cool for school type bitches. I had to breeze about and hurry up, answer the door. It's only a matter of time until this game explodes or something. I oh, know, here's Andrew. 
He knows Alison. Oh, and he also knows the haughty student teacher who gave my son the bad grade. She's called Tabitha. Oh, right, what a name. So I call this terrible, terrible teacher, Ms. Savage. Oh, she'll be hearing from off. Come about this. And I'm absolutely gobsmacked about what I'm hearing. Well, I generally don't like to get involved in student affairs. But ever since he started dating that slut, Allison, he won't talk to me anymore. Excuse me, what? You're a teacher. Boy Poo is a son. What are you saying? Oh, <laughs> well, I was just helping him deal with things that he was finding hard to grasp during normal school hours. I'm just saying, a boy his age, in his prime, should really be grateful of the skills and techniques that an older, more educated woman can provide. Listen, if you don't tell your son to break up with Allison and resume our tutoring sessions, I can make sure he won't graduate. <laughs> you do want your son to go to college, don't you? Wait, what has Tabitha been doing with boy poo? Am I being blackmailed by her now? Does she really think I'm going to pimp out my son to her? Bloody hell, and her father's the superintendent. You know what that means. Steamed hams or something, innit? What's with this woman, though? Why is she going to ruin my son's life? It w if it weren't dear son's life, it would have been a slay. Reluctantly, I guess my only option is to blackmail her back. I scour the cul-de-sac for information. Bree mentioned that Tabitha may or may have not murdered a brother. So once I mistakenly listened to Susan's conundrum, no one cares, and stomping on that old bitch's flowers, I get back to working on the blackmailing to stop her from canoodling with my precious son. Um, guys, I don't think this is a kid's game. I tell son that we're having pasta for tea, but I must speak with him first. But my Whoa. son loves me. Thanks, Mom. You're the greatest. Can Allison sleep over this weekend? What a cheeky lad. What a scallywag. What a ragamuffin, etc. Life is filled with difficult choices. And with every one of these choices comes the risk of regret. Regret can remind us of past mistakes in order to avoid making the same bad choices in the future. But sometimes we are forced to live with our mistakes and face the compromises we made, the ones that seemed reasonable at the time, the ones that sometimes rear their ugly heads in ways we could not imagine, and cause us to regret once more. Just want to say, why do I have to wash this weird fetus thong though? There's evil Tabitha doing her evil thing. My good friend Bree Vandekamp's dinner parties were always the talk of Wisteria Lane. She prided herself on the perfection of everything in her home. From being the perfect host, to making the perfect hors d'oeuvres. Although she was comfortable in the knowledge that she threw the best dinner parties on Wisteria Lane, Bree didn't consider herself a competitive person. However, sometimes all it takes is one little thing for someone's true nature to be brought to light. Bree looks as though she's a bulldog chewing a wasp. Look at the state of her. And you know what? All they do is choose Daniel's hors d'oeuvres instead of hers. Miserable cow. Hey! Flung in at the deep I end, so I'm now forced to play come. poker. I'm not gonna lie, guys. I'm kind of scared. What have I got myself into? I don't want the gambling to get out of control. But as it so happens, it will never get out of control. Because call me it because I don't get. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get what that means, neither. But hope is not all lost. Because in between Texans, Pokem Hold'em... Po yeah, uh, whatever people say. We're having a good old bitch about our Daniel. So yet again, call me the postcode lottery because I'm knocking at Daniel's door. But it changed to 10 p.m. So I guess the patrons of Wisteria Lane turn in for the night at 10 p.m. No nighttime shenanigans here. What are they, pensioners? As a result, Daniel slams the bloody door in my face. The game got jammed yet again, and I'm stuck in purgatory and autosave 
Where is she? Where is she? So once surviving the hellish poker game shenanigans that I lost again, I go see our Danny again and he's doing a fashion show or something. I don't know. I'd just stop listening to be honest, but I have to cook, garden, improve my home, just be the domestic goddess that I am. For some reason, on my way back home, I'd run into that old hag again, Mrs. Davenport. What do you want? And now she's moaning about a garden that I destroyed. However, I get off scot-free and instead is blaming a dog. Wait, this woman has now likened her garden being ruined to that of a child being mauled. Naturally come to the conclusion that we have to go and get Mike Delfino's dog put down. Sounds about right, to be honest. So after doing my 60 second makeover and painting all my walls and recarpeting my house to a more, I don't know, girly vibe? It actually turns out that I was actually supposed to upgrade items, not paint the bloody house. So I can only afford to like upgrade a couple of items, but it's fine. I've done what was required. I visit the Mike Delfino and bloody hell, he really looks like Mike Delfino. Oh, what's that? The bloody Scarvo kids at a garden. I go and try to speak to them, get the truth out of them. However, those kids are very good kids and do not speak to strangers. I tell them I'm not a stranger, I'm poo, but they're adamant. Whilst I'm busy attempting to blackmail children, my therapist decides to call me for another session. Mate, I'm busy. I'm trying to blackmail children. After my attempts to befriend the neighbourhood were in vain, I decide to head to the mall, just in time to miss my therapy session, but in time to purchase those Scarvo kids some candy. I guess oh, whilst I'm here, I might as well pick up this prescription pad from the hubby's office and just lingering around asking to be stolen. And turns out we can use this to purchase medication, such as PTSD meds or other medicines that increase our needs like composure and vanity and such. And it's just what the doctor ordered, quite literally. I give these kids the sweets, ah yes, just like giving candy to a baby or whatever the saying is. And in return, they spill the tea about that old wench's husband without any time to spare. I get on my PC and Facebook stalk, ah oh, Miss Davenport. And what's this? An obituary of being retracted. Her husband got married to someone else. What the hell is this poor old bitch doing? But is my calling, one must blackmail her. We must clear Bongo's name, you know, the dog. But for now, I must have a good night's kip with me shoes on. A new day, a new dawn, and time to confront Essa about her apparently deceased hubby. I say, Rod ain't dead, he's a honeymoon man. Once that's all being cleared up, I let all Mike know that he's not in trouble anymore and tell him, I know a way that you can thank me, wink. To which he offers me free plumbing services. Ah uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. And uh, to be honest, I think I do need me pipes to be snaked if you catch me drift. To which I'm asked to follow me to the bedroom. That's where I keep my tools for this kind of job. What? Well, thanks for that, Mike. Calling me impressed. I can't believe what I've done, though. I can't believe what I've done. I've cheated on my husband. I haul myself over to therapy to absolve myself of my sins. I'm sure therapy works in the same kind of way as going to confession does, right? Therapists must keep that gob short or, yeah, something like that. I woefully say, Hello, Dr. Hendrickson. Followed by the rage of not remembering holding my son Boipu as a child. Oh, and now I'm working through all those feelings as I now feel like there's something off in the marriage. Well, Doc, I'll tell you what I remember. Go in the park with mother and father. My confirmation. Even my first kiss. Everything's clear until. Have a great day now. What the hell? Therapy is shite. This takes too long. Ah, well, that's enough trauma for one day. Time to see a man about being a model. Competition. It's hardwired into us from an early age. It can bring out the best, as well as the worst. And while every competition has its winners, it must by definition have its losers as well.
Sometimes it's best to stand back in order to allow others to shine. Pooh be playing cards as if she can even play cards. Any fashion designer will tell you the right design communicates something powerful to all observers. The right outfit can help us express many facets of our personalities, sometimes even more than mere words. Although sometimes we choose our clothing, to intentionally hide what lies beneath. Ah yes, the fashion show. Edie's angry walk and a mysterious letter from a mysterious man in a trench coat. Always a delight to see Pooh wearing the absolute bare minimum in a cutscene. As per usual, here is our Daniel calling me hey. at stupid o'clock. What do you want? We arrange to meet in the cul-de-sac. He confides in me that he hasn't got the fabric and that the only people that would be able to access the fabric would be the ones that have that kind of money to spend on their clothes. Pooh be like, <laughs> standing there in a all negligee. <laughs> well, mate, that ain't me. That ain't me. Daniel then starts talking all this fashion shite. Mate, stop, just because I'm a girl. But then he tells me. The other girls didn't get to have this much input, you know. Oh, well, just call me someone who likes fashion because you talk to me. Oh yeah. Suddenly my phone rings and it's Gabby. Hey, I heard you were looking for something. <laughs> Love, I'm literally just standing here. I head to Gabby's house for this elusive and rare fabric. I'm intrigued, I'm not gonna lie. But I get to her abode and she's arguing with Carlos. Oh, where's my popcorn? Because that's what you do when you're watching an argument, isn't it? Carlos then says something about Gabby being a housewife. And I think to myself, it's a shame he doesn't send, say like desperate and housewife in the same sentence because that would have been kind of funny because it's like the show. But I believe Gabby, a kitchen should be seen and not used. And I ultimately come to the conclusion that Carlos is evil. Oh, here we go. Gabby's finally noticed me. What an absolute bore. And you know what? I've decided she's horrid too. She wants me to cook for her with my flawed cooking that only me is capable of. Listen here, love. I'll have you know that Pooh is the best chef. She'd be making gelepano soup and such. Reluctantly, I craft a meatloaf and I'm learning more and more about the culinary arts every day. It turns out that meatloaf has a banana in it. I grudgingly give my meatloaf to Gabby and all I can say is, shut up. With my rare and exquisite fabric in hand, I go and see our Daniel and he's not amazed at me obtaining it, you know. Mate, listen, I crafted a meatloaf for this, so... After telling Beverly from Beverly's boutique to shut up, and an afternoon of errands running back and forth, I let myself into Daniel's house and his brother Frank is on a phone, acting all weird. Hmm. One has to eavesdrop, methinks. My curiosity is peaked again. That detective is now talking to Frank. What is he, a baby? He says he doesn't talk to strangers. So weird. Alas, a woman's work is never done. I rush around to gather a statement from each of the girls for some fashion reason. And after all that's done, I go and see my fave, Edie. She wants me to ruin someone's dress, but I guess I did it too late because she gives me a call and is like, have you forgotten what you were supposed to do? You know what? I'm a busy woman. But I destroyed Gabby's dress anyway. Fashion show ready. Backstage. Slaying the runway. Twerking on the runway. All those things that you can do on a runway. I have a fan approach me. Vinny Corsetti. Who wishes me good luck. Oh. Okay. Vinny. Um, Pooh. Pooh starts flirting with the bloke. Check out that hand. Prudence camp vibes are off the scale. Pooh's shenanigans cannot be stopped. Now the guy in the trench coat is telling me that Vinny is bad news. Um, what? Jealousy is a disease, bitch. Uh, get well soon. Everyone craves a little attention now and then. Sometimes this attention merely reinforces how we feel about ourselves. Other times, it can lead to anger and resentment.
but one should be careful with the amount of attention you seek, since you never know exactly who has their eye on you. Well, all eyes are on poo, but not necessarily for good reasons. We've been left with a lot of food for thought. Um, scram for scraw. From the day we are born, all of us want to be appreciated. And while some can't get enough attention, others can get by with just the occasional bit of it now and then. Sometimes, when it comes to being appreciated, the most important question is not whether we are getting attention, but who in particular is giving it. Gabby, <laughs> she to be walking. So here we go, postcode lottery time again, as Edie comes and knocking at my door, along with the handsome Vincent Corsetti. Oh, I'll always have time for a handsome bloke. But after walking through each room of my house, I think to myself, why is he getting shown around my house? Is Edie selling my house to him? Am I getting evicted or something? Once they leave, I realise I got mailed a locket and I be pondering, why did somebody put a sore throat sweet in my mailbox? <laughs> but then S Susan calls me. I take a trip over the streets to see the apparent jewellery expert, Gabby, to give me the lowdown on this locket. And we just walk into her house and tells me it's me in the locket. So, on the verge of making scarvo soup, my husband bloody calls me and saying he won't be home on time for my scranalicious lasagna tea. Can't get the staff. And you know what he's doing instead? Taking his secretary out and asks my opinion on what kind of jewellery to buy her. Honestly, um, what time is it, husband? Because it looks like it's divorce time. Although it was a mistake last time to give her a second chance, I'd do it again and ask Brie for her opinion about the whole ordeal. She suggests a potential snooping session. <laughs> well, of course, I'm bloody up for that. And of course, bloody Dr. Fraser Crane rings for a session. Brilliant timing as per usual, but I can two birds one stone the situation. Oh, now bloody Daniel rings me. Apparently Frank hasn't left his room. Why is that my problem though? <laughs> I'm just so popular, what can I say? So after pouring my heart out to the therapist, apparently my life was normal until a drunk driver killed my parents. Just barely 16. So our poo left the Nexicans household at 16, got a job in the coffee shop, slept in the loft, and scribed a letter to that boy. But what boy? left with a lot of scranny food for thought. The session is abruptly ended. Always when it gets good, innit? Why are they so evil, these therapists? Snooping sesh is now on the cards, and why is Jackie being so horrible to me? And why do the people rotate like this? Husband's like, hi honey, <laughs> after rotating. Hi, I guess. Why on earth is my husband buying this slag gift? I don't believe him. I believe that he's cheating on me. So to prove that he's not, he comes home for dinner with me. Oh great, I guess. Almost forgetting that I have to visit the Fox's household, I swing by in an attempt to get that moody bastard Frank out of his room. But he's such a miserable twat, just like a child so I'll leave him be. I asked my son about Frank and he put a weird message online saying his final farewells. Oh bloody hell. I'll go and investigate with my own pooey eyes to see what the bloke has to say for himself on his cringe little form. The ick is unbearable, his name is Double Trouble and tells his community to fight on men. Turns out he, he does in fact have his haters though. There's always a hater around isn't there? Wild and Crazy 91 says, Good riddance, you suck at this game anyway. <laughs> Gotta say, what a slay from our oh, wild and crazy 91. Poker time once again comes around quicker and quicker every year. I did find out some news about Vincent though. He is an impressive man. I did a credit check on him and I probably shouldn't be telling any of you this, but he scored 846. That's insane. 
people can be billionaires. I don't bat an eye. But a credit score like that? Oh, God, teach me your ways, great one. <laughs> I also mentioned to the girls that you can play poker online too. But they all ignore me for some reason. I pop straight over to our Daniels and tell him about Frank's weird message he left on that forum. And that's the end of the episode. How we respond to the attention of strangers often dictates how we are perceived. Shying away from it too much can lead to suspicion. Whereas welcoming attention may be a tacit agreement to another's advances. But sometimes it's even more puzzling determining why the attention is paid in the first place. Who receives flowers from Vincent and the trench cloak bloke just be watching? To my good friend Bree Vandekamp, cooking is both an art form and a skill. It requires creative vision to prepare unique and interesting dishes. And an almost scientific precision is required to ensure success. It is the many intangibles, determination, focus, and most importantly, persistence, that separate the merely good from the great. Wow, that was insightful. So my husband is off and I get a peculiar and mysterious call. And turns out this woman has some info about my hubby that I'll find interesting. Well, call my interest peaked. Love, apparently another victim of chronic infidelity. I'm told that my husband is basically a cheating bastard and that him and the secretary are involved in something graphic. What? Like a t-shirt? She then tells me that men are not to be trusted. This elusive lass then tells me the hubby has a safe at the rear of his office with disturbing and interesting info in it. Yes, that is correct, mystery woman. Us women need to stick together. So following that insightful phone call, I head over to Mike's to get my pipe snaked. And it was just what the doctor ordered, but not my husband, doctor. Come on, everyone. We must boo at our husband, the evil man. I consult with local stupid bitch. Susan about the old husband's infidelity and we concoct a plot on how me, Pooh, can successfully get into that safe. Once I've sabotaged Bree's spice rack in order to win the baking competition, I summon my husband home by making him a lovely winter warmer, a real home-cooked meal, a fruit salad. And just as planned, Susan rings my husband and tells him clumps of her hair's fallen out. You know what, she's actually kind of funny. With time of the essence, I rush over to the medical centre and open that Pandora's box of a safe. Suddenly, Jackie appears, taking a picture off me. Wait, what? I'm absolutely horrified. This so-called fellow woman, my saviour, an anonymous caller was actually evil, evil Jackie. Who was feeling so vulnerable at the moment? She finally thought she had someone on her side, but no, it was evil Jackie. If there was an option to murder her, I would. She set me up. I feel a fool. Jackie now says to me that if she can't have him, no one can, and that she's going to destroy his reputation, so back off. Why is she saying all this? She can have him if she really wants. I don't want him. God, I really don't want to go home. I don't want to face the consequences for my actions. I'm trembling. Luckily, I don't run into the husband, so I just upgrade my bed and go to sleep. I awaken to a new dawn, a fresh perspective, and decide to Facebook stalk that evil bitch Jackie. And apparently, she's done this type of shit before. I decide to go and load the burdens of my discoveries onto the therapist, and suggests that I come clean to my husband, and proposes that we have a couple session with husband, and you know what? They say, customer's always right. And I mean, I'm paying you for the services, so you know, listen to me. No. The therapist keeps drifting back to the idea of telling my husband about it. But no, doctor, I have other ideas. I want to blackmail a bitch. Angrily stomping my way out of the doctor's office, I see Jackie in the distance. Kiss. Who else? But another woman. You know what? If it weren't me she was blackmailing, I'd be tempted to say, slay. But... 
as it's our poo's life that's been toyed around with, I confront her girlfriend about how the bitch Jackie attempted to seduce my husband. I've got the receipts, printouts of a last company. Hmm, does this look familiar perchance, Jackie girl mate? Yes, Jackie is indeed a woman. So yeah, we go and attempt to get her fired. Me and Jackie's girlfriend a force to be reckoned with. We go and confront my husband about the whole ordeal and he's gutted. He's saying, oh, she's been doing such a great job around here. And I'll often be like, she's even better in the bedroom. Husband starts gooning, so I slap that horny old bastard. However, even after discovering all this, he's reluctant to fire Jackie. And then you know what? Jackie, the audacity, calls my husband sweetie in front of a girlfriend and in front of me too. Eventually, husband does the correct thing and uh, Sir Alan sugars the bitch, you're fired. Facing the truth can be a difficult task for even the strongest among us. Often it means facing our worst demons head on. But sometimes the truth is simply too much to bear. And we find ourselves full of fear and self-loathing, totally alone in the world, even if we're in a room full of people. Security can be difficult to acquire. Some of us pursue security in the company of others, whereas others rely on more complicated measures. But regardless of what means we choose to protect ourselves, there is no question that there are few things as unsettling as when our own security is called into question. What? Why did Bree do this? Oh, it's all drama. What the hell? Who the hell is after boring old twat Frank Fox? Well, after that, it becomes apparent that someone broke into the Pudin's household. While we were all asleep, how frightening. I wonder where our boy Pooh is. And also, why the hell is there a knife in the photo of Frank Fox? Husband Pooh said that he's gonna be staying home from work today. Typical when that Jackie woman is no longer around. He likes to stay at home with his family. But anyway, after Hubby spouts some dickhead sexist remark, I teach him how to cook meatballs. And my husband carries on being a right twat. And you know what? I'm proper craving an affair right now. But Daniel calls me to tell me Frank's coming over. I'm not ready to have visitors. I'm annoyed. I need to have an affair. But hey, I answer the door and Frank starts spouting the usual shite, blah blah blah, a company funneling money into an offshore account, blah blah blah, Cayman Island, a tale as old as time. Frank admits he didn't set up my computer out of the goodness of his heart, he used our own computer to install spyware so he could keep an eye on shit. Honestly, I don't know what to say, I've been used as per usual, they could have killed me or anything. I head to the mall after a cheeky gardening session to see this mystery bloke in the trench coat and he tells me that Frank is not dangerous at all, it, but you can't tell me. What the hell? I shortly decide to awkwardly seduce Paul Young. So am I to understand, you really want to be with me? No, no. You've got it all wrong. I've just never been propositioned. I've been watching you for a long time. He really pull Younged. So I'm now a computer hacker or something and hack into this federal agent's account. And imagine your password is like Panther. How embarrassing. And why is this FBI website like got a cheeky picture of him at the top? Like a weird little website you'd make when you were a kid. Why does he look like that? After an old fashioned seducing the husband, I go and see our Daniel to see what he's after. Oh, and of course he needs a gun. Oh, wait, what? Daniel needs a gun? Apparently due to a past incident, he can't purchase a gun. So therefore I must obtain the gun for him. And if they're not in, he's fine with me stealing the gun. I just want to know what this past incident was, why he can't purchase a gun. What was it? What skeletons are in our Danny's closet? So being the general dog's body that I am, I go and ask beloved Mike for a gun. And well, he just gives it to me. I was expecting it to be a bit more difficult, but you know. Anyway, I rush back to Daniel because I'm such a loyal bitch. I suddenly receive a call from the husband saying there's been an accident. Frank Fox is acting all weird. He's been beaten up or something. But I must check on our Daniel. But after all this time, I can actually call people on my mobile. So once he answers, I hear a smack bang and wallop in the background. I say it bye with a big smile on my face and rush over to Daniel's. And well, turns out he's dead. Oh my god, where does it hurt? Why just, oh my god. No, don't die, Daniel. 
with his last dying breath in the camp, desperate housewives, way of doing things. He asks me. Take care of my begonias. Well, that was a desperate housewife death if I ever did see one. You are definitely one for the scrapbook. In an idyllic place like Wisteria Lane, it's easy to take things for granted. The comfort and strength that only a spouse can offer. The support of a family. And the health and safety of one's children. For poor Frank Fox, he'll never have the opportunity to tell his little brother how much he loved him. How much he respected him. And how far he will go to avenge his death. For some people, tragedy creates a burden too overwhelming to bear. And while mourning may provide relief for many of us, for others, it does nothing to alleviate their pain and suffering. In Frank Fox's case, it only fuels his rage toward the people who committed this heinous act. And we run the risk of watching one tragedy quickly lead into another. Our next episode starts with Pooh in the graveyard and Frank Fox is sitting there with Mike's beautiful gun wanting to avenge his brother's death. R.I.P. Daniel. Gone and never forgotten. Hello officer, just call me Pooh. Bree rings me, apparently upset about Daniel's death. She's organising a little rendezvous. <laughs> I'm manifesting that no poker is involved though. I've also been asked to wear the dress that Daniel made for me. What a shame, I enjoy wearing my lingerie. I whack the old glad rags on and visit poor old Frank, but turns out that Frank is not actually there. However, one happens upon the mailman. I decide to seduce him. This is like a dream. The hottest housewife on Wisteria Lane coming on to me? Let's not waste any more time. And after my hanky-panky, I call Frank, and he's such a weird bloke, but I guess his brother did just get murdered, so I'll let him off this time. He goes on to say, I'd like to help, but it looks like I'll be stuck in some seedy motel somewhere watching the boob tube. What? So after speaking to Frank, I just asked the officer how hard it is. You know. <laughs> the job. And after probing the policeman for information, apparently there are two people and two unidentified prints in the house. <laughs> Coincidentally, there are two convicted felons living on Wisteria Lane right now that I suspect we'll be investigating pretty soon. Michael Solis and Carlos Delfino. <laughs> Boy, wait a minute, policeman. He's got the names mixed up. He says Michael Solis and Carlos Delfino. And no one even noticed there's the mistake. What the hell's going on, everyone? Did anyone else notice that? Oh, but what's going on? The officer tells me that Daniel was slain at 11 p.m. <laughs> well, when the clock strikes 11, they say slain. We are given a reconstruction of how it went down, apparently with Carlos and Mike being the perpetrators. Initially, I visit Mike Solis, and of course, he didn't even know that Daniel was dead and just starts slagging him off. So I break the bad news to him and give him a cheeky kiss for all the help. And after confirming Mike's alibi with Susan, I go and attempt to bed Carl. However, Easy returns home. Just before we were about to do the deed, she kicks me out. Rude. After my humiliation has worn off, I go and quiz Carlos about his whereabouts on the eve of the bloke's death. And like, who's Gabby talking to? Because it's not me. Now Gabby is like, saying that she saw two people outside my house. Ugh, what? Waste of bloody time. On my journey back to my humble abode, I bump into Boy Poo and asks if he heard anything outside the house and claims that he was playing that utter war game with double trouble. And um, wasn't that Frank's username? Well, son, I think you were talking utter gobshite about utter war. My son is now being an absolute twat. I tell him I've had enough of your abuse anyway. To make myself feel better, I go and seduce Carl. Wait a minute, why are, we, why are we talking like this after the deed is done in this position? Why did you walk away? Bree now enlightens me about her son's whereabouts on the eve of the murder. And my son was in fact courting her daughter, Danielle. What? 
My son has no respect for me. He's always lying. Now there's a cutscene where my son and Bree's daughter are the perpetrators. As it so happens, my timing was wrong and it's 7pm. So one messed up cutscene later, I'm at Bree's soiree. I slap Bree. Edie's here in a negligee, so I slap her too. Then I talk to Gabby through the wall, and you know what? I'll treat myself and slap her too. After I earn the PhD in slapology, I have to talk to Brie again about our children as our convo was cut short. I confront Boy Poo about his lie and he'd be like, that girl can't keep her mouth shut. And the cheeky bitch I am, I say to him, oh, isn't that reason you liked her anyway? Then my son shocks me. Um. After Mrs. Vandekamp finished her angry diatribe, I'm gobsmacked. A what? A what? He's not my son. Boy Poo would never know an intelligent word like that. Now, another cutscene where a car pulls up to Lynette and Boy Poo just starts rotating. So off I go to accuse Lynette of flirting with some random blokes in a car. Then, ugly, hideous Tom starts slagging off my son, followed by him being horrible to his wife. And then I'm just sent around all the bloody houses, only to be back at Gabby's. Because apparently, it was here at the car all along. Another reconstructions of the events later, and Gabby gave them directions. Directions to the Fox's household? Oh my god. What? Gabby has also got the bloke's phone number? I decide to head to Carlos Delfino's and sleep with him because I'm not happy with Gabby's behaviour on the eve of our Daniel's death. Following that eventful event with our Carlos, I decide to call the mystery number and Derek Okora answers, but I fear he cannot use a phone. A technophobe as it were. So I decide to call that Vincent, you know, handsome but dangerous bloke with an extremely high credit score and see if he can give me a bit of information. At first he doesn't know Leo, but all of a sudden he does. Oh, okay then, I believe you thousands wouldn't. Once I put the phone down to our Vincent, the FBI bloke calls me, asking me what the hell I think I'm doing. <laughs> um, what do you think you're doing? I'm just living a normal day in the world of prudence. Anyway, look what I've done. I've caused a massive traffic jam being on the phone. <laughs> Pooh really did stop traffic this day. I go and meet the FBI bloke who's actually called Eric. He tells me that with Daniel's murder, there's more than meets the eye. Our Vinny has two lives, one's a nice bloke, the other, the member of the mob. Who likes living on the edge though? Stepping into that dangerous territory, shark infested custard as it were. But apparently Vinny's thugs killed Daniel and it was supposed to be Frank who died. You know what, they really did kill the wrong brother. Am I right fellas? Eric now demands that I not get involved with Vinny. <laughs> Shut up, no, I don't know you. And then goes on to tell him that I'm nothing but faithful to my husband, knowing full well that I've had many a conquest on this cul-de-sac. Eric then comes clean that it was he who sent me the locket. And apparently I gave the locket to him before I left town to start my new life with Vincent. <laughs> Mate, I doubt that, I can't bloody remember you. Then he's like, Mary. Yes, Mary, I'm talking about you. <laughs> I'm not Mary, I'm Poo. Then he keeps on calling me Mary, it's freaking me out. And you know what? You're damn right, I do have a new life without you, you creep. He says it's, it's me and him in a wood drive of country fair. No, it isn't. And it continues to warn me about Vincent. I can't promise you anything, Eric, love. I do like living life on the edge. I call Frank immediately and tell him of my findings. And he already knows it all. <laughs> what the hell? I worked so hard to find all that out. Wasted my time. The scenario of who actually killed our Daniel plays out. Most people's lives are driven by fear. Fear of hidden dangers. Fear of secrets being discovered. Or fear of the unknown. But sometimes, what we think may be a demon lurking in the shadows, turns out to be merely our guardian angel in disguise. What is my husband still playing in that bloody safe for?
There are people who spend a lifetime earning the respect and admiration of their peers and neighbors. It can all be for naught. When one's decency is called into question. Looks like there's a witch hunt out for blood for our poor old son. And the way he's cutting Carlos's hedges reminds me of that boy that Gabby had the affair with. Look, it's the boy poo hate brigade. Apparently my son has ruined their daughter's lives. <laughs> Maybe they should all get a grip. Oh, and here comes bloody Allison saying my son sent us some emails. Honestly, boy poo has had so many lady friends since we moved here. Like mother, like son, I guess. And well, we've fallen out with a lot of people, even bloody Carl Mayer. But you know what? It's what you gotta do for your family, innit? I'm about to start my day, but I get an unexpected call from Vincent, and I tell him that my life's a train wreck. Then he asks me about my relationship with my husband. Bit invasive, but um, you know what? It's fine. Everything's fine in the old marriage. Of course he knows all about the secretary bitch Jackie. <laughs> How embarrassing. But now Vinny starts asking about that safe of my husband's. I'm like, how does he know all this? And then Vinny's gonna send me a little care package later. But I can't open it while my husband's there. Ooh, how intriguing. I'm excited to hopefully get some face masks, hot chocolate. I'll make a real nice of it. Anyway, back to work. My garden's a right state. I'm no longer Monty Don. Call me evil Monty Don. I head over to my enemies, Mrs. Davenport, to see if she has anything to kill these evil bugs. But I notice that she's got a shit ton of rat poison. But who am I to judge? I accidentally sneak into her house and steal some money from her purse, when I was just meant to show her one of these weird dead bugs from my garden. <laughs> what can I say? Kleptomaniac. Whilst analysing this flyer that says Danielle is a slag on it, I discover on the back of it is a missing dog poster. Then I soon discover a dog necklace in Mrs. Davenport's garden. What is the answer that this is all pointing to? I go ask Mike. Come on, Mike. Tell us who it is. Then goes on to say Mrs. Davenport has an opinion of our Danielle. Oh, of course, everyone has an opinion of that Danielle. Now Mike has a crazy theory that Mrs. Davenport killed all the missing animals. So I confront the hoe with this theory. And she only did go and bloody kill them all. I could protest, but why bother? You got me. Those pesky animals make a wonderful fertilizer, by the way. I was trying to report her to the authorities, but she was saying I can't even pay me off because she's struggling with the mortgage and that she's too old for jail. <laughs> you killed animals. She's trying to blame her husband now for her killing habit or something, but you know what, I've stopped listening to be honest. I don't care anymore, you bitch. So I violently stomp on her garden. This will be my way of getting justice for these pets that have been cruelly murdered. So I pop on my glad rags, investigate this flyer, and force my son to write Danielle is easy, which he gladly does. But I decide that this is girl writing. I quiz Danielle, and she said it was Julie. Then I just start arguing with this child for some reason. <laughs> so hard being a mother. But I do love a good argument. Shame you can't eat popcorn while you're arguing, it'd be kinda cool. Then I ask Julie about the whole ordeal. I make her write Danielle is easy in some sort of cryptic obituary to Daniel Fox. This is insane. <laughs> Frank will know about Alison's email, so. I visit him under false pretenses of seeing how he's getting on following the murder of his brother. And he's like, what do you really want? <laughs> After being exposed like that, I head home and discover that I have a pool in my garden which is unusable and also a mower madness mower that I cannot mow with. So I go back inside and ask my son if anyone knows his password. And you know what? Of course that bloody evil Tabitha knows his password, that evil evil woman. Why are there so many evil people on Wisteria Lane? So I'm on the prowl for the mailman that I'd slept with in a prior episode, but I mess up with what I was saying. So plan B it is, seduce the bloke in order to obtain that package. Fair exchange in Wisteria Lane I guess. I confront Tabitha with my findings and she'd be like, I am untouchable in this town honey, but baby, I'm mates with the FBI, which shut her up. Yeah, bitch. 
You'll believe me when you get strip searched by a prison guard, or maybe you'd like that. Pooh, why did you say that? Look who comes crawling back and wants to make a deal. My old mate from the FBI says you'll get six to eight years for bringing those illegal bugs in. So my mate locks up the bitch, throws away the key, all in a day's work. Everything is sorted thanks to mummy. Then he's like, it's a bit harsh, isn't it? <laughs> no, my dear son, that is what happens where you mess with the pudences. But you know what? It is my son's bloody fault for canoodling with all these weird women. To succeed in life, it is important to understand when it's time to fight the good fight and when it's time to make amends. Even though this can be frustrating, it's a fact of life. But when things are taken too far, we may well find ourselves forced to pay the price for years to come. When presented with the truth about a terrible situation, one must choose to address their problems head on or simply deal with the circumstances at hand. When faced with the complexity of life and the tough decisions that must be made, sometimes one has to wonder if there is any wisdom to the thought that ignorance is bliss. <laughs> Wait, what? There's a marriage certificate that says deceased and Pooh goes to stab husband while he's sleeping. <laughs> what is going on? Oh, evil sleeping husband. He has some explaining to do. He arises from his slumber fully clothed and says various things to piss me off. So I tell him he might want to change that combination to his silly little safe of his, as it's not safe anymore. He should call it a danger. Husband then says, my safe, in an anime voice. What, my safe? I guess that's what our Vinny sent me, the contents of that infamous safe. After a bit more gaslighting, my husband says, I need to see my therapist more, but I'll have a hard time getting there. He left my car keys at Frank's. What the hell? Why is he so evil? Following that, he tells me to go and run my little errands, as in take the poison back to Mrs. Davenport. And by poison, the dumb, dumbass man. He thinks I mean alcohol? <laughs> no mate, it's pesticide, I'm, I'm just a gardening cow. Though after calling my husband a rat bastard, he quickly frigs off. Oh, and look at the timing. The little nosy busybody, Susan Mayer, asking how things are. I naturally lie through my teeth, but then she states, I walked past your house and heard shouting. Of course, you were walking past, how convenient. Reluctantly, I ask if we can talk about it, because I really don't want to talk about it with her. And then she's like, what now? Now's not a good time. <laughs> Um, bitch, why did you offer then? Ego already battered and bruised. I found out that she's blowing me off for Edie. That harlot. She's coming over to gossip. I try and invite myself around, but she's having absolutely none of it. It does make your mind wonder. Is it me they're gossiping about? I head to Mrs. Davenport to drop off that poison. But there she is, having a mother's meeting. Nattering away to Arbury. So I eavesdrop the conversation. And are they... Are they chatting about me and my male friends? What are they really talking about? Plants or me and code? Bree says that she admires my stiff upper lip and was she aware of my alter ego pop star, worldwide renowned creator of wartime song? Even Churchill knew. Stiff upper lip going off without a blip. Oh. They were actually talking about flowers. How fucking boring. What about me? Then Mrs. Davenport says a very peculiar comment to me. I have more friends than what I know what to do with. What's that supposed to mean, love? Next on my husband's patronising list of errands that I had to run, we'll get my car keys back from Frank's house. He invites me in and then goes looking for the keys for ages. <laughs> what was he doing with them? So whilst he's gone, his phone rings. 
Eric's talking a load of FBI shite, as always. And wait, Frank's moving. They're gonna sell his home. Oh, Frank's so bloody weird. And I finally received my keys. Why does he even have them though? But he looks so sad, so I decide to seduce him, the strange little bloke. But you're married. Then I'd better get to work on you. I think the term is coined a sympathy shag. I attempt to discreetly leave after our shenanigans, but he stops me to tell me that he's leaving and he doesn't have a choice. And I'm like, mate, I'll listen to your voicemail. I already know. And for some reason, we're getting an aerial view of this conversation. He goes on to open up about his relationship with Daniel. He says Daniel was like a nagging wife and that he, Frank, was a troublemaker. I tell him, I guess that's why his username was Double Trouble and he gets embarrassed and gets the fucking gun out. <laughs> No, but you do be talking all this boring shite. Please shut up, Frank, you're boring. And I'm so fed up of him talking. Maybe you deserve to be miserable. And maybe it's your fault he's dead. Now Frank reveals to me his big fat secret that the mob's family has been taken down and that he's gonna need protection from Vincent and his goons. Real gooners. You know what? I really didn't see that coming. I did just listen to Antrin's machine, but you know what? I give him a hug and half expect him to be assassinated. Sadly, instead the game gets stuck. However, I'm made aware of a long list of men that I have adulterated with. So I have a gander at all this stuff from the safe that Vincent sent me. I thought they were in my room, so I walk home and go upstairs, but they're actually in my pocket. The accordion file provided by Paul Young has a plethora of um, repressed memories. Strange, it's in my husband's safe of all places. A picture of a woman in her early 30s with a beaming smile on her face. The photo is slightly faded and has a number of creases on it, telling you it's been handled repeatedly over a long period of time. On a sonogram of an unborn child, as one might expect, the gender is indistinguishable from the picture. This item seems to be a journal of some sort kept by your husband, and the majority of the entries are negligible. But there are a few scattered entries in particular that stand out from the rest. There are a lot of weird writings going on. Um, somewhat triggering, so I'm not going to read them. Again, I'm left with a lot of food for thought. I tend to my garden and a quick visit to our old friend, the therapist. And on my way, I bump into who else but good old Eric. Oh, what a pleasant surprise. I'm like, oh yeah, Frank's already told me, lol. And then he's like, I gotta go. <laughs> just like the rest of them, eh? I tell him about these blokes and the bloke, how that bloke called me Mary, but he makes me feel insane. God, Arthur, you're making me sound like a nutcase. This is not what I'm paying you for. I go on to tell him about Vincent's package and its contents. And he's like, what does it say about this situation? Um, mate, it proves that I was right. I decide Vincent is the culprit of killing our dear Daniel. And the therapist is like, that's quite an accusation. Um, hell yeah, it is. Like, I'm pretty sure that they've all, everyone's kind of said it. Even the FBI agent has said that it was Vincent who killed Daniel. Oh, it's almost as if I'm living in a twisted soap opera called, like, Desperate Housewives or something. My therapist then asks me what I plan on doing. You know what, mate? What do I even pay you for? You're supposed to tell me, but oh no, he can't choose for me. I'm gonna have to choose. Make up your mind now before it's too late or it'll be made up for you. Um, is that a threat or a promise? Upon exiting an extremely enlightening visit to the therapist, I see Vincent and Eric are talking. And I, I thought that, is Vincent talking to the policeman and Eric is just in the way? But turns out, Eric is supposed to be there because he starts talking. What a weird way to have a conversation. Oh, but my men are fighting. Poo be swooning. Vincent tells our Eric. Would think that stalking someone under the pretense of a federal investigation in an attempt to rekindle a failed relationship is considered a crime somewhere. Dereliction of duty, abuse of power, false representation. Take your pick. Vincent ate and left no crumbs. I continue with my new favourite hobby, eavesdropping, and they do be roasting each other. <laughs> Such a sleigh. I feel like my composure and shit's a bit low, so I get my PTSD meds and such from the pharmacy and take the opportunity to go and talk to the pharmacist, and he's acting all weird. I guess he didn't pay his council tax. I take advantage of being able to talk to the shopkeeper of the pawn shop, and he says niche instead of niche. Does it not make sense to fill the niche? I'm just saying, my store, my niche. He says niche instead of niche. <laughs> 
What? After all that fun, I head home and receive a call from my husband. Hello, husband poo. Wait a second, the cheeky bastard want to give me the opportunity for explaining myself. Me? I? Me? But I wasn't the person with all those questionable journal entries. Apparently, I'm the one who's been acting strange. Husband be like, it didn't start until you started hanging out with dot dot dot. I'm given a choice of the three men to choose from. I ponder if I should choose my hubby, but I guess I made the wrong choice because I chose him. <laughs> and now my phone's it won't stop ringing. So you know what that means. I do some yoga on Gabby's porch, but because it's 10 p.m., I get yoga transported to my own room and go to bed. Turns out I can pick a different male now, so I change my mind. I pick our error. All of a sudden, I'm struck with a realization. It's not FBI, it's FIB. How embarrassing. It's like am I high or something. But here's our Eric calling now. How thrilling. He's coming for a tea. Just in time to watch some deal or no deal box fails on YouTube with me. But my phone's still ringing. After rustling up some scran, Eric arrives and my son do be sitting. And when boy poo leaves so me and Eric can get down to business. Hopefully means the sexy kind of dessert business that all these men go on about. But then he'd be like, boy poo didn't want to listen to two old fogies. Excuse me. Speak for yourself, mate. Turns out the business isn't sexy dessert at all. It tells me that I was dangerously close to being on Vincent's bad side. Oh, apparently I was holding Vincent back when he first started out, so he wanted to get rid of me. I'd be like, oh, I thought my husband was the weird one. But oh, Eric has more shite to expose about the hubby, about his ex-wife. Um, Eric, are you sure you got the right husband poo pudence? Apparently his first wife had a rare blood disease that he treated himself at home. And Eric keeps on calling me Mary, but yeah, Eric is right. What kind of bloke wants to kill the woman he loves? And yeah, Eric is right. What kind of man doesn't tell you that he watched his wife die a slow and painful death? I've been given a lot of food for thought. I'd be, I'd be munching a while. I'm right on cue. The husband poo arrives. The party's just getting started. Husband's like, who are you talking to? I'm happy like, a lion snake, that's who. In any relationship, conflict is inevitable. Whether it be the simple act of more than one person wanting the same thing, or more complicated needs among friends and neighbors. Conflict surrounds us all. But when it comes to the severity of consequences, the battles between a husband and a wife leave them all behind. Over the years, I've learned the hard way that there are no simple choices in life. Since my departure, things seem to have gotten even more complicated for my friends on Wisteria Lane as well as my newest neighbor. Indeed, making a choice between the status quo, the chance to live on the edge, or to rekindle a long lost passion is a difficult and complicated affair. But sometimes we find ourselves with no other option than to make a choice. And we can find the very decision liberating in and of itself. Who removes her wedding ring and ponders her potential suitors? Husband and Eric are just sitting there tied up. Vincent has a gun and Boy Poo is just standing there all confuddled. Oh wow, <laughs> this is getting good. <laughs> Poo be rubbing her hands together. Well, turns out it's finally time to pick the bloke I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. What a dramatic change of events. I asked Vincent what he can do for me. That's a good question. I see you haven't lost all your smarts. You'll live a life of luxury. I'll see to it that you can have everything you've ever wanted. You'll never have to cook another meal or clean a house ever again. No more cooking and cleaning? That sounds bloody marvellous. Husband Pooh, what can you do for me? One thing's for certain, things need to be different. I'll do whatever you want, marriage counselling, a family therapist, whatever it takes. I just don't want to lose you. I can't live without you. Boring. Eric, your turn. Well, you could expect me to make an honest living, provide you with everything you need, and 
some of the things you want. I'd be home every night in time for family dinner, and I'd treat you like you deserve to be treated, with respect. Hmm, compelling arguments, but I'm not old. I can look after myself. Eric kind of pisses me off about calling me Mary. I ain't Mary. Come on, fellas. Time for specifics. Husband says, some boring, selfish shite. Vincent. I would take you to a little out-of-the-way French restaurant I know of that makes the best creme brulee you'll ever have. After that, we'll head back to my estate, open a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon, and let things progress naturally. Oh, very compelling. What a swell evening that sounds. Eric, your turn. I'd take you down to the local police precinct and have you give a written statement about everything that happened tonight. Why do you ask? Oh, that's rubbish. Final question. Anything you haven't told me, men? Husband Pooh be like, I told you everything, but that Eric isn't a saint. All right. I asked Vincent if there's anything else he wants to tell me. Larson has a whole story concocted that explains everything he wants you to believe. He says that I know you, that he knows you, and that I killed you. Which, of course, means that I should go to jail, right? Really convenient how that all works out for him, isn't it? He gets the girl and the collar. It's almost too good to be true, isn't it, Larson? Mmm, yes. A very compelling argument from our Vinny. Eric, your turn. Sorry to disappoint you, but I've told you the truth from day one. Hell, I always tell the truth. It's probably my greatest flaw. Oh, where is him? Eric tells me about my apparent amnesia that I've had for the past 20 years. I love that Boy Pooh is just here, just listening to all these goings-ons. So now Vincent asks me the ultimate question. Who do I want to spend the rest of my life with? I calmly tell him to, don't rush me. So as we do in a hostage situation, we go and tighten everyone's ropes. I take delight in tightening the hobby's ropes. But while I'm mid-tight, he tells me to loosen Eric's, um, don't tell me what to do, and then asks me to do whatever I can to stop Vinny from going insane. He thinks he has a shot with you. Um, shut up, husband. I go and tighten Eric, and he be making all these promises that Vinny will be behind bars forever. As I loosen our Eric's rope, I can't really say, just make sure he doesn't shoot me. Boy Pooh has finally decided to talk, and we just have to, we, he just says, um, what's going on here, mom? So, so normally. Boy Pooh says, oh, you sure know how to pick a winner, don't you, mom? <laughs> You're telling me, son. Boy Pooh is being asked to double check the ropes, and the absolute twat says it's actually kind of loose. I raised my son wrong. What an absolute twat. What the hell? I naturally act oblivious. Um, I've got weak hands, mate. I can't do that kind of manual labour. Tying ropes and all sorts. However, Vinny's an intelligent bastard and asks me to use the gun to get rid of the person I don't want to see again, and then tells me, I, Pooh, will not take the fall as he's taking care of everything. Oh, isn't that nice? Husband Pooh, thou doth protest too much. Let's hear your little song and dance so we can finally get this over and done with. Husband Pooh, all his secrets come out like he's just got diarrhea or something. You found me on a beach unconscious. Oh my god, he's a weirdo. He tells me that we're living the American dream, why spoil it? Ugh, you're the only monster here, husband Poe. Vinny, your turn. Who would you be better off never seeing again? The Weasley investigator, the deceitful spouse, or the charming and incredibly handsome out-of-towner? Hmm, very compelling argument. Eric, your turn. There's really nothing else to say. I love you. I always have. That was pathetic. That was the best reason you could come up with to spare your life. Can't get the staff. It's too bad I can't shoot you all at once. I try shooting my son, but it turns out you're not allowed to do that. Or shooting yourself. So, who will I choose? Who will she choose? Who will she choose? This. Oh, she's pondering, she's pondering. Lots of food for thought. She's munching, she's just swirling. She's spinning. It's out of control. 
But eventually, I go for husband poo because you know what? I think everyone would. Why is he so horrible? Oh, and it turns out, <laughs> how embarrassing, it turns out the gun isn't even loaded. <laughs> now, husband and Eric are judging me and shaming me for trying to shoot husband. I feel kind of bad now. Um, sorry, I guess. But boy poo is up for it. When it comes to women, corsetis always get what they want. How does that sound to you? I'm not sure, but it sounds cool to me. You know what, husband Pooh? You don't know how to treat a lady, hence the choice of you. Even with all you know about me, you still sound unconvinced. Care to take a test drive? Um, okay, this is all moving a bit fast, but okay. Husband Pooh is mad, though. You can't be serious. Now? You're going to have sex with this lunatic now? In our bedroom? <laughs> yeah. He said do anything to make him not go insane, so yeah. Just before we head upstairs for the old hanky-panky, my son wants a little chat. You're about to bang a mob boss with dad tied up in the living room. <laughs> I guess I am, son. I guess I am. But I'm torn. I, I don't know who to choose. I want to say I'll be better off alone, but I also want to pick Eric. And I want to pick Vincent. Oh, choices. The therapist was right. Inevitably, I pick Eric, <sighs> I guess. I head upstairs with our Vinny and grab his weapon. Oh, and then Vinny calls me Mary. <laughs> nah, I don't like you mate anymore, you can die. Oh, Eric was worried. Bless the bastard. Then Vinny calls me a bitch. There's no need for that, I'm just innocent poo. Oh, husband poo is not happy with me picking Eric. But why would I pick you? You don't even like me. Now husband poo and Eric are aiming a gun at each other. Well, this evening is turning out to be a night full of surprises, isn't it? This comes out, I can't go back to a normal life. I'd have to shut down my practice, move to another town. Everything would change. I mean it, hold it right there. And it's all your fault! When faced with tough decisions, one is often forced to make sacrifices. Some of us choose to sacrifice stability. Some of us choose to forgo excitement and lavish riches. While others choose to rekindle relationships from years past in a hope of recapturing the happiness that has eluded them for so long. For even though our choices may never be perfect, With time, effort, and the support of those closest to us, we somehow find a way to reach for the brass ring and find happiness nonetheless. Oh, there's a gunshot. Husband Poo is dead. Finally. And here's our ending cutscene. It didn't take long for Eric to step in as a husband and father. Oh, and here they are, the desperate housewives, the nosy bitches have come to see what went down, and that's it. The credits start to roll. But you know what? After sleeping on it, I feel a lot of regret in my choices and decide to play the episode again. With the correct choices, I start off by slapping my son for calling me a slut, and an ending that's much more say. Satisfactory. It's lonely at the top. Wow, what a game. I really enjoyed this game, you know. Experiencing one of my favourite TV shows from the inside and being my own patron of Wisteria Lane, I got to interact with my favourite and not so favourite characters and sometimes getting to know them a little more intimately, shall we say. I would highly recommend this game. There's even character secrets to unlock if you can even be asked doing that. But to be honest, it was really difficult to install, so you might as well just, just watch this video and call it a day. I bloody love this game though. Neighbours murdering pets, neighbours murdering neighbours, and just being a good old fashioned town bike was a thrill in itself. I will need a new bedpost with all the notches I be getting. If I were to score this, I would give it a slay out of slay, whatever that means. Anyway, on to the parish notices. I'm glad to see the back of this bloody game as I completed it at the start of November. 
from the installation to the recording, my laptop's suicidal tendencies she did not want to switch on, to my editing software who just decided to have a good old fashioned not work after I've completed the half of the video of course. So apologies if the last half of the video is shite compared to the start. I'm just a baby spluttering and stumbling my way around the DaVinci Resolve. I do be watching them tutorials though. However, if the second half is better, well, that's fantastic news for me. Oh, did I forget to mention the corrupted files? Hence the video not including much voice acting from the game. Honestly, it's been an uphill struggle from day one. Oh yeah, and I recorded the script twice because I fell asleep in the middle of it. What? What? Oh my god, she is such a grafter. But oh yeah, I'm gonna shut up now. Anyway. Thank you as always my kind viewers who have indulged me, watch my daft videos throughout 2023. It was somewhat of a difficult year for myself, I'm not gonna lie. But to play and talk absolute bollocks about my silly little games got me through it and I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you, thank you for your comments, encouragement, likes and dislikes and just even clicking on the video. I appreciate it so much. So. Grab your glass of Book's Fizz and here's a toast to more daftness in 2024. Until next time, fellas.